An entitled mother rips an arm off of a disabled person. So I've been told to share this. Not sure if anyone will be interested. This is about my adoptive mother. My adoptive parents are British citizens who moved to my country in the EU. They adopted me actually expecting mental disabilities, but I was just profoundly deaf. You would think that would be easier. So I grow up. I get enrolled in deaf schools where I learn sign language, but my mother decides it's too hard for her to learn sign language and actually bans me from using it in the house. I had to mime or point at things until I could start writing a pun, which I carried around a notebook everywhere. If I did try to sign, I was called disrespectful for not including her in the conversation. In a strange way, this made my written language skills very good, as well as my lip reading, skills which many deaf people have challenges with. It was very difficult and upsetting living with her. My adoptive father was nice, but he just listened to whatever she wanted so he became a bad parent too. I went to university and limited contacting them. The one time I tried to visit them for the holidays, I returned to a house with a stranger family. My adoptive parents had moved back to Britain without telling me who does that. This mom was probably like, Oh I left you a voicemail, didn't you hear it? Our next Reddit post from Cryptic Broccoli. Chapter 1. The Backstory. Getting right into it my parents aren't exactly on the best of terms. Actually, they haven't been on remotely decent terms for a while now after their 22-year marriage. They got a divorce back in mid-2013 when I was in 6th grade. The exact dates are a bit hazy, but I'd say it was around April or May of that year. It was quite bitter. I don't think the things my parents said to each other in the courtrooms are appropriate here. But long story short they effing hated each other after the divorce proceedings started. I live with my mom at our old house she started spewing a bunch of BS accusations about the fact that your father is the worst human being on the planet he's corrupting your minds and a lot more hateful untrue stuff but I was only 11 which was way too young to know that it was actually BS I just blindly accepted it as fact because that's what I'd been more or less raised to do. But this was only the beginning. At this point, the monitor visit started happening. This was at about early to mid-March 2014. Also, if you're wondering why they were monitored, it was because on a scale of 1 to 10, my parents, a level of trust in each other, was at a minus 187,000 million. Anyways, for a few hours every Saturday, I was handed off to my dad and we'd hang out somewhere like K1 Speed or his parents' house. Then I was given back to my mother and I'd go about my existence as an annoying as hell 11 year old not ashamed to admit it. I was pretty weird. Then a plot twist happened, more like life twist, but you get the idea. Over Thanksgiving break, in 7th grade, my dad got full custody of me. I went to live with him in his bachelor pad and I thought that was that. But my mom was livid, I had to say it. Whenever we had visits, she would try to pull me to the side and tell me not to listen to my dad. To tell him I didn't want to live with him, or some other BS. But the monitor would step in because that wasn't allowed. Just like the rest of the stuff she did. After this point, I continued middle school. My grades got heaps better, and monitored visits started again. But this time with my mom. Only the visits were a little different. Important. Later, me and my dad drove to a drop-off point to park close to my mom's house. I was given to the monitor. Then we drove to my mom's house, did stuff, then went back to the drop-off point and I went back to my dad's place. It was also at this point in my life where I learned to not blindly accept things my parents ate as fact, unless it was actually true. Duh. This was because I learned that what my mom said about my dad wasn't true. I started questioning her reasoning, but I didn't tell anyone. In hindsight, I should have. I didn't really know who to trust more or who to listen to. Life was somehow as normal as it could have been for someone in my situation. That is until Monday, April 6, 2015. Maybe all this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't a Monday, I think to myself in my fevered imagination. Chapter 2 The part where it gets interesting on this fateful day was when everything got turned completely upside down. At first it was just like any other Monday visit. I went to her house, only she wasn't waiting on the porch as usual. She was in front of her house, in her car. I thought, okay, that's a little weird, and thought nothing of it. When the monitor pulled into the driveway with me in the back seat, my mom pulled forward and blocked the monitor's car in. When we got out of the car, she was yelling at me to get in the car, which I stupidly did because I didn't know any better. The monitor rushes over and says, no, you can't do this. This is against the rules. My mother responds with, no, I'm protecting him from his terrible father or something along those lines. I don't know. I was in the car and couldn't hear. Apparently, from what I learned later on, she physically assaulted the monitor before getting in the car and driving off as we pulled away. 
I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was probably something like, we are going to start a better life for ourselves somewhere where we can forget all our problems and start over, or some other BS. We get to Lax, about a half an hour after the visit was scheduled to end, and she asked me where I want to go. I say Washington DC because I'd never been there before, but we ended up hitching a flight to Chicago. For some reason, I will never forget what I said to myself as we took off. There goes my life as I know it and wouldn't you know it. I was right. When we landed, we were called off the plane and detained for questioning. My mother and I were put in separate rooms, but the whole time I could hear her repeating. I had to do what I had to do to protect my son. I got no sleep that night because those words were haunting me the whole time. The next day, I was sent on a solo flight back to Lax. That was my first time flying alone. But before I left, my mother said to me, When you get there, tell your father that you don't want to live with him anymore. Deep down, I knew that the proper course of action was electing to ignore that stupid decision. But me being the idiot 12-year-old, I was. I said I'd do that, you know, like a liar. On the way back home from Lax, my dad told me that the incident had made the news in the clip that he showed me. My dad summed it up perfectly. It's worse than hell. I don't know what hell is like, but this is it for me. The next day at school, everyone was like, whoa, what the heck happened? We saw you on the news last night and thought you died. And in some twisted way, they were rights. For the next few years, my mom would be in and out of jail for repeated violations of a court-ordered restraining order because she kept trying to sign me out of school. I'll never forget how on the age I was when she did this for the first time. But as the years went on, she did this throughout my freshman, sophomore, and junior years, I became sort of uncomfortably numb to her repeated special guest appearances in my life. The last straw was when she showed up at my house over this past summer, not once, not twice, but on three distinct occasions. Now it was my turn to be levied on a court-mandated Skype call on a Tuesday night with my mom's older sister and her mom, who are unlike my birth giver, Sane. My mom kept poking her head and trying to see me. At that point, I'd had just about enough and I exploded. I finally called her out on her BS. In hindsight, there were some other things I should have said and maybe some stuff I shouldn't have said, but that night was one of the best of my life. I finally felt that I had a sense of closure and that she finally understood how she was affecting me, except for the fact that she didn't understand that Sarah, me and my dad spotted her on the main road next to my house. Again, we immediately reported it to the police and she was picked up soon after. She currently resides in jail. Chapter 3 Epilogue The ending to this debacle is somewhat of a bittersweet one. Sweet because she'll be in jail for the rest of my senior year, and thus I don't have to worry about her showing up again. The bitter part is having to figure out how to prepare for when she's eventually let out in the aftermath that may or may not ensue shortly thereafter. It's well, a debacle more than anything, but it's life. Not a good life, but life nonetheless. My dad and his girlfriend have been extremely supportive of this matter and I can't thank them enough. As for me, I've been trying to live my best life, and after a significant bout of depression and a suicide attempt, I feel like I'm coming out on top. If you read this, which I doubt you will, you, mom, opus, the main thing I got out of this story is that you've got to stop beating yourself up. You can't blame yourself for making dumb decisions when you're 8 or 10 or 12 or whatever because you were 8 or 10 or 12 or whatever. People that young can't possibly expect you to make adult decisions. That's why they've got adults in their lives who are supposed to make those decisions for them. So I'm glad you're finally out of that situation. But honestly you have got to stop blaming yourself because what happened to you was not your fault. Our next Reddit post from The Barker. So this story takes place somewhere in the late 90 seconds. Early aughts backstory. My mom was in an accident when she was 14 and lost her right arm. She has about one fourth of that arm left that she calls her stub. And to be honest, the loss hasn't done much to derail her. She drives. She has a joystick thing which sticks out of the wheel and she turns it like she's doing a shave. She calls it her knob loudly and in public. She worked for a long time until she started having issues with the arm she does have. And she's my hero. But you're here for the story, so here goes. Mom and I go to the supermarket at the busy hours on a weekend because we couldn't make our usual after-school weekday trip when things were less crazy. We go around the whole parking lot twice, as do a row of cars behind us, and we finally manage to nab a disabled spot right by the entrance because someone was leaving as we approached. Now, my mother rarely uses the disabled parking, even though she's permitted because she always says people who can't walk, etc. need it more. But again, she's permitted and there weren't any other spaces. After we park and get out, we hear our car honk a few times, followed by excuse me as a woman runs up from behind, catching us just before the entrance to the store. This woman literally left her car running in the middle of a busy parking lot, causing a massive pileup. 
So Karen, that's her name, now catches our attention with her shouting. And when we turn around, we're greeted with her. Can I speak to the manager? Haircuts 90 seconds edition and about half a dozen kids ranging from goth tween to a toddler in her arms. Karen then goes on to explain how the spot my mom just parked in is for disabled people in an accusatory tone. My mom was wearing her prosthetic arm underneath her long-sleeved denim coat, overly big, so the fingertips of her prosthetic were barely visible. So it was an honest mistake, even though it was a little odd the way she'd abandoned her car and ran up to us with her entire litter. Still, my mom smiles and proclaims, don't worry, I'm allowed to park there, and we turn. Back around, that answer wasn't good enough for Karen. Suddenly, Karen and her kids are in front of us, and she's given the toddler to another one of her children just so she can fold her arms and pout. As you can see, she gestures towards her kids. I have a lot going on and I need that spot more than you do. You only have one child. Now I must have only been six or seven, but even I knew the difference between disabled parking and those spaces reserved for parents with small children. I said something along the lines of, you need a disabled badge to park there. It doesn't matter how many kids you have in six to seven year old lingo. And this woman took a major offense. She goes off on a major rant about how being a mother of all her children was hard and how she was having an awful day slash week slash month. And it's not fair that my mom who looked perfectly fine had tricked the government into getting a badge that lets her park in a spot that Karen should obviously have. Instead, as she rambles about this, she looks around, garnering the attention of other shoppers and is doing that. Don't you agree with me? The thing that people do to validate themselves, but never give anyone a chance to respond because she was already on to the next person my mom grabs my hand and tries to leave me around Karen ignoring her entirely. But Karen keeps stepping in front of my mom demanding her spot. She's getting increasingly annoyed and loud. I remember asking my mom several times if I did something wrong because my response seemed to have triggered this rant but she kept reassuring me that I was fine and that I should just ignore her, which annoyed Karen even more. This goes on for about 5 minutes, a very long 5 minutes before my mom finally snaps. I have one arm silencing Karen mid-sentence. I used to wonder why she didn't just tell Karen the specifics earlier, but as I've grown up I've come to realize that it wasn't anyone else's business, and I can see why my mom wouldn't want to take off her jacket, which is kind of a chore for her, and pop the prosthetic just to prove something. So we begin to walk around Karen again, but barely make it five feet before we hear her go. B asks, what happened next is seared into my brain. Karen storms up to my mother and tries to undress her the denim jacket, and is just shaking my mother and calling her a liar. And my mother goes into full fight to the death mode because physical altercations are obviously more intense and scary for her. She starts scratching, flailing, kicking, and even tries landing a headbutt on Karen. And as she does this, one of Karen's children attempt to jump in and help their mom, which leads to me jumping in to help mine and suddenly are brawling with her kids. This couldn't have lasted longer than 30 seconds. It was enough time for people to stop and gather, but not enough for anyone to react. Slash put a stop to it. I can't imagine what it must have looked like. Two women in their 30 seconds fighting as their children do the same by them. But it all came to a stop when somehow Karen manages to yank my mom's denim jacket from her and off pops her prosthetic with it crashing to the ground and resulting in a universal gasp that shook the entire parking lot. Okay, exaggeration, but it was definitely a moment. All that's left on my mom's arm at this point is a suction pad and a sharp nail-like hook that slots into the prosthetic. It looks like a blade sticking out of her stub. And without missing a beat, my mom raises it to Karen and in a sarcastic tone goes, Come on then. I wish I was old enough at the time to realize how hilarious that was. A woman from the crowd that gathered around us stormed into our little fight circle and picked my mom's arm up and handed it to her before going off on Karen, who looks smaller than seven-year-old me at that point. People started shouting to get security, etc. and Karen rallies her spawn and they all run for her car. I still remember her kids yelling for her not to leave them because only her oldies could keep up with her running away as the rest trailed behind. My mom was visibly shaken by the incident but wanted to save face for me in the crowd that was suddenly hounding us. She insists she's fine, she doesn't want to please, doesn't want the fuss, and we go about our shopping. When we got to the checkout, about 20 to 30 minutes later, a few of the people that witnessed the whole thing had gathered and insisted they pay for my mom's shopping, which she reluctantly accepted. Then they helped us take all the shopping out to the car. And when we get home, my mom tells me she doesn't want me getting into any fights ever again. 
then she lets me have way too many donuts. Then, oops, here's another story about his mom in the comments. Since everyone seems to love my mom as much as I do now, I just want to share this little unrelated story in the comments. So my mom lost her arm due to playing on the train lines when she was a teenager. I won't go into the specifics but yes, hit by a train, not sucked under, but since flying from what I've been told anyway. After she stopped working, she was restless. So she volunteered for the Cubs group, which in the UK is the younger version of Scouts Think Boy Scouts in America. She'd often talk about the hazard of playing on and near train lines, and at one point wanted to go around schools and scout groups doing talks about safety, etc. Especially seeing as hanging out near the train line was still a thing. Teens in our town in the 90 seconds. This was still when my mom always wore her prosthetics, so a lot of kids in the Cubs group would argue as to whether or not she actually had a false arm because she always wore that long-sleeved denim jacket. I was constantly hounded about it because kids are stupid and find this stuff interesting. It was never really something my mom addressed then. It just so happened that the big talk she'd been planning to give that take up the latter half of our Cub meetings also fell around Halloween. Yes, this is going exactly where you think it is. Everyone sits down around my mom and listens for a good 30 to 40 minutes about her experience and what happened to her. The coma, physical therapy, spinal issues she suffered with for a long time, etc. She's hamming it up to make it more interesting. The lights are dim and she's got generic Halloween creepy music playing on a CD player beside her. But she hasn't mentioned her arm loss, even though a lot of people are mumbling about it loudly. Parents are arriving and standing at the back of the hall, waiting, and most of the kids are getting quite restless and rude at this point. Finally, someone asks loudly if my mom really only has one arm, and she responds by reaching into her jacket. She purposefully not put the arm in the sleeve and just hidden it under the jacket, and then tears it off and waves it around in the air with a scream. One kid cried. Parents got worked up. I died laughing and my mother was asked never to give a speech again. Opie, honestly your mom sounds awesome, and to be honest that Karen sounds like she's more disabled than your mom is. That was our last entitled parents, and don't forget to hit that like button.